What's going on everyone, Jack here from Half Chrome. And in this video, I'm gonna walk through the part 107 exam, the practice exam that the FAA put out there. I'm gonna walk through the questions and the answers, and I'm gonna explain why. So what you want to do before you watch this video is you're gonna to wanna to download that test. I've got a PDF uh, of that exam on our website, link in the description. And I also created um, a condensed version of the test supplement. Now the test supplement is this booklet that they give you, it's super thick. Um, it's got all sorts of information. It's not all related to just this test. Um, so I took only the pages that are gonna be relevant for you and I condensed them, put them together also in a PDF, also on our website, also in a link down below. So take some time and download those two things. Pause this, take the test, and then let's run through the answers. So I'm gonna give you reasons why these are the answers. So that's gonna help you with the test. Got it? All right. Now, while you're downloading that information, let me tell you who I am. My name is Jack Town, and I've been flying drones since 2016, actually before that. But my brother-in-law, Chris, and I started a business in 2016, flying, reviewing drones. Uh, Chris was actually one of the very first people ever to pass the Part 107 exam. Now, neither of us do YouTube full-time. He's a full-time engineer. I'm a full-time teacher. And actually, I teach a high school drones class. And one of the things that we do is we learn this 107. So I've built a curriculum in my free time to teach these kids how to pass this part 107 exam. And if you're a Patreon, I'm going to share all of that information with you. If not, there's plenty of other information out there, uh, some different resources on our website, as well as on YouTube that are going to help you pass that exam. Uh, but if you're looking for more information, again, check that link down below. All right, we'll be right back. And we're going to run through the answers to this test. <music> Okay, so what are the characteristics of a moist, unstable air mass? Now the answer here is A. Okay, so here are some things that go along with stable air conditions, layered clouds, smooth air, poor visibility because the wind's not pushing things away, so you may see some haze or fog and continued precipitation. When we're looking at unstable air, um, we're looking for a dangerous looking clouds, turbulent air, good visibility, and showery precipitation. Okay, number two, according to 14 CRF part 107, how many a remote pilot operate in an unmanned class C airspace? Okay, so in class C airspace, you're gonna need uh, air traffic control approval. Um, so the remote pilot A must have prior authorization from ATC. You gotta have the approval before you fly, right? Not just monitoring the frequency, you're not doing it after you fly. According to 14107, the remote pilot in command of a small manned unmanned aircraft plane to operate within Class C airspace. We just went over this. Do you need a visual observer? No, it'd be nice. Do you have to fly or, uh, file a flight plan? No. Uh, do you need ATC authorization? Absolutely. C is the answer. All right, so what effect does high density altitude high have on the efficiency of a UA propeller? Now, uh, high density altitude is the same as high altitude. So let's look at that. Density altitude is the thickness in the air, right? Uh, high density means lighter, thinner air. Uh, low density means thicker, heavier air. So do you want to fly in high or low density altitude? Think about that, right? Um, thin air, less efficient aircraft. So you don't want to fly in high density altitude. Your batteries are going to drain quicker. Um, this happens. This is important. You may see other questions about this. High elevations, low atmos atmospheric pressure, high temperature, high humidity. Low density altitude is thicker air. That's where you want to fly. It's more efficient. Um, there are some conditions that create that. Low elevation, high atmospheric pressure, low temperature, and low humidity. Okay, so refer to figure 22 area two. This is where that chart supplement comes into play. You can't answer this question without it. Uh, at Cour de Alain, maybe I'm saying it right, I don't know, which frequency should be used as the CTAF to monitor airport traffic? So if you have your chart supplement, let me pull that up. Now, the, the easiest way to use this supplement is to kind of pull it up and let it kind of all get here and downloaded, and then you can use it to search for the different figures that you're looking for. The trick I like to use on your keyboard, hit Control F, you get this little search box, and then you type in 
what you're looking for, figure 22, hit enter, you see it highlight, and pulls up the page I'm looking for. All right, so I'm looking for the CTAF at COE Airport. Okay, so as I look here, uh, there's the airport, there's the COE, I'm looking for the CTAF, and the CTAF is gonna be the, uh, the numbers with the C next to it. So right here, I see 122.8. Uh, hopefully that's one of my answers. It is. That's why it's C. What technique should a remote pilot uh, use to scan for traffic? They should systematically focus on different segments of the sky for short intervals. That is the answer, right? Um, segment, segment, segment. All right. According to figure two, uh, if the unmanned aircraft, unmanned Airplane weighs 33 pounds. What approximate weight would the airplane structure be required to support during a 30 degree banked turn while maintaining altitude? So we got to do a little bit of math here. So first let's pull up figure two. All right, so load factor. So this is a load factor chart. We got to do a little bit of math here. Um, so at 30 degrees, I need a load factor of 1.154. So I'm going to take the weight of the aircraft and multiply it by 1.154, and we're going to round it. So I'm going to go 33 times 1.154, and I'm going to get just over 38 pounds. 38 pounds is my answer. Now you do get a calculator, at least every time I've gone with students, they've been given a calculator for the exam, but um, they don't let you use your phone. So keep that in mind. Uh, at our airport, they lock them in a safe or in a locker or something like that. Okay, refer to figure 23. What is the floor of Savannah class C airspace at the outer circle? Okay, so now we gotta go to uh, figure 23. Okay, so we're looking at Savannah C at the outer circle. Savannah C at the outer circle. Savannah C at the outer circle. All right, so the outer circle, I see this 41 over 13. Um, so, and it's this magenta circle, right? And if you don't remember, um, what colors are what that's okay actually okay um, if you go all the way to the page two of the supplement whether it's the condensed one um, or my version right you get this legend and take a look there right so we can see this magenta is class c airspace so we know that's going to be the answer it's class c airspace but then i have to interpret i have to interpret that fraction. I see 41 over 13, 41 over 13. Okay. So it's classy airspace starting at 1300 feet, ending at 4,100 feet. All right. Now my question, I have AGL or MSL, right? Uh, is it mean sea level or is it AGL above ground level? All the numbers on the chart are mean sea level, unless they're in parentheses, then they're above ground level. So eight has to be B. All right, so figure 20, area three. All right, let's go figure 20. All right, so figure 20, this is area three by the number three. That's kind of the helpful hint. Sometimes it's hard to find the actual air, airspace. All right, with ATC authorization, you are operating your small unmanned aircraft approximately four statute miles southeast of Elizabeth City Regional Airport. What hazard is indicated to be in that area? All right, so um, let's see. All right, uh, Elizabeth City. All right, I see unmarked balloon on a cable, 3008 MSL. Check your no TAMs. That's going to be it. Um, unmarked balloon, 3008 feet AGL MSL. Which one was it? OMSL. So that is my answer. C. Figure 21. You've been hired by a farmer to use your small UA to inspect his crops. The area you're about to serve is Devil's Lake, West Moa, area of east, east of area two. How would you find out if the Moa is active? Now, I don't need to look um, at figure 21 here. I just need to know what's happening, right? So where is that information? Is it on the chart Le legend? Um, is it available in the database? No. Is it... Uh, a military operations directory no it's in the chart legend or at least it should be um 
probably would be in the chart supplement, um, but uh, legend is where we're going for that information according to the FAA. All right, the most comprehensive information on a given airport is provided by uh, chart supplement. It just is. The chart supplement has all sorts of really good information out there for you. Right, you're going to get the latitude and longitude, runway information, airspace information, um, communication section, lots of stuff there, potential hazards. Um, all that stuff is going to be in that chart supplement for you. Now, um, you can get all this information from vrmap.com. That's where I generally get my stuff. Okay, uh, number 12, there are a handful of questions like this. Identify the hazardous attitude or characteristic remote pilot of space while taking risks in order to impress others. They have a whole section on hazardous attitudes and how you combat or what is the antidote to those uh, attitudes. So just a quick rundown on what the FAA says they are. They have five. They have the anti-authority um, they have the impulsivity uh, and uh, they have the invulnerability. Uh, they have the macho man, <laughs> the macho man attitude, um, and they have the resignation attitude. So those are the attitudes uh, that the FAA wants you to understand. In this case, we're talking about my man, Randy Savage, macho. Okay. Um, refer to figure 26 area 4 you've been hired to inspect the tower to, under construction um, they give you some coordinates near james jamestown regional what must you receive prior to flying your aircraft in this area right the only place now i could look at this and figure out what airspace it's in but um you don't get authorization from the military you don't get it from the national park service you get it from the atc air traffic control so it's got to be b all right number 14 uh Figure 20, area five. How about, how about a remote PIC check no TAMs as noted in the caution box regarding the unmarked balloon? Now, again, I don't need to go there. I just need to know what is happening. Now, to check no TAMs, uh, notice to airmen, uh, those are basically briefings that tell you something is happening. Okay, it's not on the Before You Fly mobile app. You're not gonna contact the FAA. You're gonna go to a website uh, that has that information. They say 1-800-WXBrief.com. I wouldn't go there, right? That's not where I get my information, but uh, there are places you can go. That is the answer. C is the answer. You'll see that question. That's the answer they want you to give. But yeah, you can check it online. There are lots of different places and resources that are available to you. Okay, when adapting crew resource management concepts to the operation of a small UA, CRM must be integrated into all phases of the operation, right? Just makes the most sense. Okay, you've been hired as a remote pilot by a local TV news station to uh, film breaking news with a small UA. You expressed a safety concern with the manager. They instructed you to fly first, ask questions later. What type of hazardous attitude is that? Let's see, impulsivity, just do it. Um, that's what they want you to know. All right. Um, so more on this local TV station. They hired other pilots to cover news stories. Uh, they've had multiple near misses with obstacles on the ground, two small accidents. What would be a solution? Okay, so they should implement a policy of no more than five crashes. That's telling us that it's okay. Uh, they do not need to make any changes. Things that happen are unavoidable. No, um, the news station should recognize hazardous attitudes, the five the FAA thinks you should, uh, situations and develop standard operating procedures that emphasize safety. Yes. Figure 26, Area 2. While monitoring Cooperstown CTAF, you hear the aircraft announce they are midfield left downwind to runway 13. Where would the aircraft be relative to the runway? Now, there will be questions about this. And what you need to understand is a little bit about airport runways. So runways are labeled 1 through 36, and each degree of a circle, right, 1 through 36, um, is how they go. So we're at runway one is 10 degrees, runway two, 20 degrees, runway three, 30 degrees, right? So runway nine is 90 degrees, okay? 18 is up and down. And, and actually, runway 18 is the same as 36. Uh, 18 goes south, 36 goes north. Uh, each runway has two labels, run one running in each direction, right? Um, 
planes will take off into the wind and that's important to know they um, they have a bunch of different rules that they follow right so to figure this out we need some information okay we need to know what runway we're talking about. Um, if they say downwind, I'm moving opposite the runway, which is almost always the case here. When I say left, I mean the runway is to the plane's left or right, the runway is to the plane's right. So with that information, let's draw it out. Okay, so the first thing I like to do is kind of draw out my scenario, um, north, south, east, and west with my runways. So runway 13 is somewhere between uh, 9 and 18, let's just say it's like this, right? So there is my runway 13. Now I know that he is midfield left downwind. So he's downwind, he's midfield. So he's in the middle, middle of this runway. So he's kind of in this area here somewhere, right? And he is left midfield right so he's left so the plane is uh the runway is to the left of the plane he's moving this direction right um with the runway here to his left so this is where my plane is so i'm in the northeast um you know if i probably drew this a little more accurate it might be a little more east than north um but either way only one of those options is going to show up i have east south and west and East is going to be my answer. To avoid a possible collision with a manned air, airplane, you estimate your small UA climb to uh, greater than 600 feet. Who you have to report that to? Um, air traffic control seems like a good answer. Uh, National Transportation Safety Board or upon request to the FAA. That's the answer. They don't need you to send incident reports to them unless something happened, right? So unless they request it, don't bother. When operating on a manned airplane, the remote pilot should consider that the load factor of the wings may be increased any time. This is an example of specific terminology you need to listen for, or look for, or read for. Um, CG is sifted rearward, no. The airplane is subject to maneuvers other than straight and level flight, yes. Anytime the air, aircraft is subjected to maneuvers other than straight and level flight, that changes the load factor, period. Answer, that's gonna be your answer. Uh, maneuvers other than strain level flight. A stall occurs, again, this is another one of those definition things you're gonna look for uh, about stalls. A stall occurs when the smooth airflow over the unmanned airplane's wing is disrupted and the lift degenerates rapidly. This is caused when the wing exceeds the critical angle of attack. That's your answer. That's the terminology, critical angle of attack, C. All right, safety is an important element for a remote pilot to consider prior to operating an unmanned aircraft system to, to prevent the final link in the accident chain. A remote pilot must consider which methodology. I don't like this question. Um, the answer is C. You need to uh, have some risk management methodology. Um, crew resource management probably also would help here. Um, so I think that's probably an acceptable answer, not according to the FAA, but... Uh, risk management is. All right, your remote pilot for a co-op energy service provider, you're using your small UA to inspect power lines in a remote area 15 hours away from your home office. After the drive, fatigue impacts your abilities to complete your assignment on time. Fatigue can be recognized by an experienced pilot, probably, but no. Um, as being an impaired state, yes, that's what it is. Um, by an ability to overcome sleep deprivation, no, it's B. Okay. Latitude and longitude, understanding that is important, um, and they will have you go through some of this a few times, right? Locating airports, so make sure you know how this works. All right, so what airport is located approximately 47 degrees, uh, 40 minutes north latitude, and 101, 26 west longitude? So my advice to you when you're trying to figure out latitude and longitude, um, you know, start in some corner of uh, of where those two things are labeled and they are, are clear on the map, okay? Then you kind of have to understand um, the midpoints between them, that's halfway, also 0.5 or 30 minutes, right? So there are 30 little tick marks to the halfway mark or 60 little tick marks along the way between lines of latitude or longitude, right? So um, kind of keep that in mind. 
So those little tick marks, they're called minutes, they're degrees. Um, those halfway points uh, are gonna be helpful or you can just kind of count it. So let's take a look at this one. All right, so when I look at figure 21, um, I'm looking for an intersection of latitude and longitude. So I see 101 and 48 right here. Now I'm trying to get to 4740 and 10126. So 10126 is almost right in the middle between the next one. So it's going to be along pretty close to this line, just you know, four clicks short. One, two, three, four. So along this line somewhere, looks like it's going to be garrison. Let's just verify uh, our other me measurement here. So we're looking for. 4740 so um, it's south of 48 so that's going to check out roughly 20 clicks 10 20 boom right so these are 10 10 uh, 10 clicks 10 minutes 10 minute marks right so it's going to be garrison confirmed Ooh, what are the current conditions for chicago midway airport figure 12. Ooh, so this is a metar thing let's go to figure 12. All right, so uh, METAR weather reports, quick tips. Okay, so these METAR reports are weather reports from the 60s and they're fairly confusing looking. We start with what kind of report is it followed by the station ID, that's the place. Uh, then we have time, Z, Z indicates Zulu, Zulu is Zulu time. Uh, first uh, two digits are the day, uh, followed by time. Is it corrected or automatic? Then we have wind speed. How do I know this is wind speed? KT, KT is knots, right? The first three numbers are the direction, in this case, uh, 220. Uh, G means gusting, gusting, how fast is gusting, um, and the wind speed. Uh, SM is statute miles. We're talking about how far can you see? What is my visibility? Um, and then I have some uh, cloud cover or other weather information uh, followed by my temperature slash dew point. So the slash is always temp dew in Celsius. We have an altimeter reading um, and then generally some remarks. So let's break down midway. Okay, so midway is here. This looks like it was, was a special report uh, run on the 12th at 1856 Zulu time. The wind is 320 degrees at five knots. Um, one and one half statute mile visibility. RA is rain. We have overclass, overcast clouds at 700 feet uh, at two zeros. 17, 16 temperature dew point. Altimeter reading of 28, 29.80 in the remarks. Uh, RAB 35, rain beginning 35 minutes after the hour. I think that's what that means. So back to here. <laughs> what was our question? Or what are, our, what are our possibilities? All right, so we have sky 700 feet overcast visibility, one and a half statute miles with rain. I think that checks out, doesn't it? Sure does. All right, so refer to, oh, figure 12. Again, wind direction velocity at KJFK is from, all right, so KJFK, KJFK, KJFK. All right, so wind. So wind I'm looking for uh, KT. So wind direction, so it's gonna be 180 degrees at four knots. So 180 at four, we've got that answer twice. It is true, it's not magnetic, true. So A is my answer. All right, according to 14 CRF part 107, was required to operate a small UA within 30 minutes after official sunset. Anti-collision lights, you need them visible for three miles. To ensure the unmanned aircraft CG not, limit, uh, not exceeded, um, what do we do? Um, we've, well, this one, it says check the, the manual, uh, the flight manual, which probably doesn't exist, then you have to make one, all right? Um, all right, according to 107, who's responsible? Whenever the question is who is responsible, the answer is almost always the remote pilot in command. The remote pilot in command is the answer to almost every question asking about people because they're always the person responsible. All right, refer to figure two. The, the chart shows a gray line with VR, 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 VR. Could this present a hazard to the operations of a small UA? So let's just look at that figure 59 real quick. 
right? So we can see what those are. Those are military training routes. Um, but let's just take a look so you can see what they look like. All right, so here we have them on the map. So they're military train routes from the surface to 1,500 feet AGL. B. All right. What does the line of latitude at area four measure? I don't need to look at that. We just need to know what is a line of latitude. Line of latitude uh, measure the degrees of latitude north and south of the equator, right? I can kind of figure this one out. Um, you know, like A and C are the same thing, right? So like both can't be correct. A lot of times you can do that with this test. Under what condition should the operator of small UA establish scheduled maintenance protocol? I think I actually just said this. Uh, when the manufacturer does not provide a ma maintenance schedule, then you come up with on yourself. 33, uh, the responsibility, who, oh my goodness, um, to inspect the UA, it's A, the remote piloting command, always, always, always the answer. Not always, but almost always. All right, according to uh, 14 CRF uh, 48, when a small, who, when would a small UA owner not be permitted to register it? if they're less than 13 years old, right? There are a bunch of rules and things that you need to know and understand. Here are a couple of other things to kind of keep in mind. You have to be 16 to take this test. Um, you have to pass it every two years. The maximum weight for a small UA, it has to be less than 55 pounds. Otherwise you have to go through this process. Um, who is exempt? Um, you only have to do this test if you're flying for commercial use. So everyone else basically it doesn't apply to hobbyists, uh, for people flying balloons, or rockets, or kites, um, training exercises, I think, or emergency use. Uh, there's another caveat in there somewhere. And how long do you have the, to notify the FAA of any changes? Like you maybe move, get 30 days. Okay, so according to this, when must a person register the small uh, UA? All civilians. Uh, all small civilians must register their aircraft if it's 0.55 pounds um, or more. A lot of times, a lot of times you hear that as 250 grams. That's kind of the magic number in the United States. 35. Uh, B is a little tricky here because it says when it's used for any purpose other than a model aircraft. Um, you know, if you do have a small one, uh, let's say you have a Mavic Mini 2, Mini 3, um, and you want to use it commercially, you do have to register that as well. Uh, cost you five bucks. All right. What is true regarding the presence of alcohol within the human body? Small amount of alcohol increases vision acuity. No. Uh, consuming an equal amount of water will increase the destruction of alcohol and alleviate a hangover. No. Uh, judgment and decision making abilities can be adversely affected by even a small amount of alcohol. Yeah. Duh. Um, remember, uh, you have to have a blood alcohol of 0.04 or lower it has to be eight hours since your last drink oh when using a small ua in commercial operation who is responsible stop reading remote pic what are the characteristics of stable air ah let's take a look all right remember stable air conditions we've got layered clouds smooth air poor visibility continuous precipitation so poor visibility and steady precipitation that's my answer Okay, so I've received an outlook briefing through whatever. Uh, it indicates a low level temperature version with high relative humidity. High humidity, uh, that's gonna be smooth air, poor visibility, fog, haze, or low clouds. Yep. Um, these are, this goes back to uh, understanding stable conditions, uh, density, altitude, all that stuff, weather conditions. That's kind of my least favorite stuff because you know I just pull up my app and I look, is it gonna rain? Is it windy? Should I fly? Okay. All right, number 41. May a remote pilot reduce the intensity of an aircraft's light during a night flight? At no time when it's in the vicinity uh, of, when a manned aircraft is in the vicinity of a UAS, when it is in the interest of safety. When it, safety is the interest of anything, that is your answer, so it's C. Uh, what must a person who is manip manipulating the controls of a small UA do if the remote pilot identification fails during flight? So remote ID, if it fails, what should you do? Land, notify, activate, lights. Um, yeah, you should land, right, and figure out why it failed. Where must a small UA serial number be listed when using either standard remote ID or broadcast module? 
uh, in the document of compliance, the manufacturer's method of compliance, the certificate registration. Uh, that's gonna be, it's gonna be inside that DOC, so it's gonna be A. All right, when pre prepping for a night flight, what should a UA pilot be aware of after assembling, conducting pre-flight of an aircraft using brief flashlight or work light? Okay, so this is kind of understanding how your eyes work at night. There's a whole night section that you probably need to study. Uh, once adapted to darkness, person's eyes are relative immune, no. Uh, it takes approximately 30 minutes for a person's eyes to fully adapt to darkness. Yes, uh, you should uh, use a flashlight equipped with LED lights to facilitate their night vision. No, um, unless it was red lights, that might be helpful, but the answer is B. All right, to conduct Category 1 operations, a remote pilot in command must use a small unmanned aircraft that weighs. Category 1 is 0.55 pounds or less. I've got this nifty chart that I made for uh, you to take a look at, uh, kind of going through some of that information. Which category of a small unmanned aircraft must have an airworthiness certificate issued by the FAA? Uh, according to that chart, let's take a look again. That's going to be four. Your surveying company is a title sponsor for a race team at the Indy 500. To promote your new uh, surveying department, you decide to video part of the race. Uh, you have a TRF for the race in the area. Of this In this situation, what do you do? You may fly your drone in the TRF since the company is sponsored a team. No. The TRF applies to all aircraft. You may not fly in the area, uh, area without a certificate of waiver or authorization. Yeah. Flying your drone is allowed if you notify all participating people the closed course. No. It's B. There you go. I hope this was helpful. There's more information on our website, uh, more resources and things like that. If you're looking for that, um, you know, Patreons, you got a whole slew of things there for you. Um, and please reach out should you have any questions. Hey, good luck and happy flying.